Could I please ask everybody to put mute on so that we have no domestic interference? Okay. I, I am uh, Juan Carlos Gamarra, the ambassador of Peru here at the UK. And uh, I thank you very much, all of you, for taking some of your valuable time and joining us today. It means a lot to us, the organizers of this briefing, to have you because we know you've left other things just to listen to this very important story we have to tell you. Our aim today is to show how British talent and technology shared freely to the world has been applied in Peru by Peruvian engineers and has saved many lives in the process. The UCL Venture CPAP device developed in the UK by UCL in association with Mercedes Formula One is successfully being used in Peruvian hospitals under the name Wairachi, which means ventilation in Quechua. These CPAPs are easy to use and low cost respiratory devices widely used in British hospitals to prevent patients having to enter ICUs and crucially being connected to respirators. Thanks to the selfless initiative of many private citizens, more than 350 units have been built in Peru to date, and around 600 more are in production. These are providing COVID-19 patients with a high pressure pumping system that allows them to breathe more easily when oxygen via a face mask alone is insufficient. But these cannot work without a breathing circuit that is not available in Peru and has to be sent there from London by air cargo. Up to now, we have been able to send over 600 circuits, very short of the amount needed. Therefore, as we hope to continue this brilliant and successful story of transfer of technology led by UCL, we desperately need to send more kits to Peru. Their full cost, including freight, is 80 pounds each. And I'm sure the following speakers will share their thoughts and convey the urgency of this effort while Peru currently undergoes its second wave of COVID-19. Now, I am pleased to give the floor over to Dr. Rebecca Shipley, Professor of Healthcare Engineering and Director of the UCL Institute of Healthcare Engineering. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be able to, to join you all today. I'm um, Rebecca Shipley. I'm a professor of healthcare engineering at University College London, um, one of the London universities. And about a year ago, or, or in March last year, we formed a consortium um, with University College Hospital, which is a big teaching hospital in London and Mercedes HPP, which are the arm of Mercedes who design and manufacture Formula One engines. And the, the goal of our consortium was to design and mass manufacture non-invasive breathing devices for, for treating COVID patients. And, and we managed to do it. So we, um, we, we basically designed a, a device that is oxygen efficient, um, working with our clinical partners and then Mercedes HPP took the devices on board and mass manufactured them. We, we had an order from the UK government to make 10,000 for the National Health Service. And I think what's really important with these devices is that they can present, sorry, they can prevent around 50% of patients who need respiratory support for COVID from progressing to needing mechanical ventilation. And that's really good for the patients. It's good if you can avoid having to mechanically ventilate them, but it's also really valuable in terms of um, optimizing how you can use the resource you've got in your healthcare system. And um, the devices are really simple. They're purely mechanical. They don't need a power supply and they're quite easy to train healthcare workers to use. So, so far in the UK, they've been used in about 130 NHS hospitals, and that's across England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and beyond that. And we've been really delighted with the uptake, and we're continuing to work very closely with the, with the UK government on that. Because of the, the international need for these devices as well for COVID patients, we released 
all of our designs and manufacturing instructions um, for free, so through an open source license. And we were really delighted that um, the Peruvian teams who you're hearing from today have taken them on board. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure working so closely and seeing the success of, of the teams. Um, they've been truly remarkable. Um, the, as, you'll, as you'll hear from them in a moment, they've managed to make a really large number for Peru. And we're delighted to continue working closely with them through the embassy to support the supply of these breathing circuits. It's worth saying that these breathing circuits are, are really critically important. Um, there's, there's a variety of breathing circuits available internationally, but we, we, we went to a lot of effort to design these ones to minimize wastage of oxygen, um, which as you'll know, is a, a really valuable resource that's um, limited. So it was limited in London and it's obviously there's limited supply in Peru. So it's, it's really important that these circuits are used alongside the, the devices um, to enable as many people as possible to be treated at one time. It's also a real pleasure to, to work closely with the International Medical Education Trust. We've worked with, with them on numerous international projects and, and they've come on board to support this initiative as well. So with that, I think I'm going to pass over to um, Daniel next, who's going to provide some summaries from the um, Peruvian engineer teams. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Yes, please, engineer Daniel Lacamine has been the leader of the engineers in Peru who manuf manufactured the CPAPs. Please, Daniel. Hello, my name is Daniel Lacamine. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer here in Peru. And together with Fernando Sato and Camilo Parra, uh, we received back in April 2020, we received uh, some, some media coverage about UCL and about the effort that they were doing with these uh, uh, UCL Ventura uh, devices. So we decided to contact them and request for the drawings. Uh, in the news, uh, they were saying that they were mechanical devices and they didn't, uh, they didn't need any power supply. So we decided to review these drawings and, and we were confident that we could be able to build them here in Peru. So we started to manufacture them. One of the issues that we had at those times that we had a, one of the, we had a really harsh lockdown here in Peru in April, 2020. So it was difficult for us to get a hold of the materials that we needed and also of the, of the tooling that we needed of those times because we're uh, able to, to manufacture uh, big drilling machines and hydraulic machines, but we're not used to build small pieces like the UCL Ventura had inside. So it was a, a challenge for us, uh, but we wanted to demonstrate that we were able to do it here in Peru. So we start building the 21st uh, prototypes back in April, between April and May. And with these first prototypes, we went to the health minister here and they decided to start uh, a testing here in three hospitals. Uh, Cayetano is one of them, hospital, the Naval Hospital is the other one, and, and a hospital also here in Lima. It's calling ATE. Uh, that's the name of the hospital. So they carried this testing. And in the meantime, also, we started contacting, uh, contacting different uh, medical staff in different hospitals until we found someone uh, who, who had actually the previous model of the UCL Ventura. I mean, UCL Ventura was actually based on, 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 on an equipment named uh, Whisperflow. And he had this, this device in his hospital. And he taught us much more of the, of the device, uh, of the use of the device. Since we are three mechanical engineers, we're not related to the, to the health system. So uh, we started a learning process with him and he showed us how useful it could be also here in Peru. So we had a lot of support from, from UCL and then we had also support from some medical staff here in Peru. Uh, so we, we started a really uh, learning curve here in, with this device and we started giving the devices to different hospitals so that it, they could uh, start using them. Also in the meantime, uh, with the help of the UK embassy of the Peruvian embassy in the UK and the, the minister here of, of 
uh, of relations with external relations, we managed to get uh, some of the CPAP kits that Rebecca was talking about. And with these uh, CPAP kits, we started also uh, providing them to the hospitals and they started seeing the, the, the advantages of having these devices with the CPAP kits in the hospitals. And they started to notice that a lot of patients uh, were not going into the mechanical ventilation, which was actually the, the, uh, a big issue at those moments. So uh, seeing that they could avoid or they could actually uh, uh, liberate some of the space for the mechanical ventilation of the CPAP devices, uh, they started asking for more of them. So uh, up to today, we have managed to manufacture about uh, 450 to 500 uh, uh, flow regulators. And we are actually providing them to an approximate of 40 hospitals. Uh, many of them are asking for the devices and also asking for the CPAP kits. And we, uh, we set us a challenge of manufacturing up to 1,000 of them. So we need to manufacture uh, 500 to 550 more of them to provide to the hospitals here. Uh, one issue that it's uh, common for everybody is the oxygen uh, problem. So to know we don't have a... a we don't have the information about which hospitals uh, or at least a whole uh, panorama of, uh, of the oxygen uh, provision in different hospitals. But we talk usually to the, to the, directly to the hospitals, to the medical staff and to the director to get this kind of information. So we know how many devices they are able to, to manage and also how many CPAP kits they will, manage, they will be able to manage. Uh, with the oxygen supply that they have at this moment. So this has been a long way for the three of us, for Fernando and Camilo, but actually we thank all the people that is uh, involved in here, especially UCL who helped us with the, with, the, with the drawings and with this initiative that has helped a lot of, uh, of people here in Peru, with the UK, with the Peruvian embassy in the UK, uh, with the different medical staff that helped us here. And uh, well, that is actually the story that we have to to share today with you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you so much. Very interesting. And now Dr. Germán Malaga will speak to us. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, certainly, I, I started, the, I received one of the first Pairachis in early in July. And certainly, I, I didn't know how to use it at that time. Initially, we started to uh, make an adaptation uh, with a calefactor to use as a uh, high-flow nasal device. Um, certainly, we were uh, enthousi very enthusiastic because uh, and before that uh, equipment, uh, we have to put the patients in a reservoir mask and if they tolerate, okay, if not, uh, so a few of them have the opportunity to go to the, to the, to a, or to a bed in the ICU. So the, the situation was very desperate because uh, if the people don't uh, have a, a good response to the, the usual mask of uh, at low flow of oxygen, we don't have any opportunity for them. Uh, we have just to see them how to die. Uh, after the, we started to use as a flow nasal, uh, flow, high flow nasal device. Um, we receive another shipment of 10 additional wairachis. Uh, this time with, um, with the SIPA, circuits and we started we, we and I, we think I think that we changed the the, 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 the game no because after the, we received the the zip up devices uh, we, we started to use the in, in this new wave uh, the initial accountability of cases 
we recruit 50, pa 50 patients in July. And the, the, our initial results were that 50% uh, 50, uh, 50 of them had been saved. Otherwise, they, every, every one of them could die. Uh, 25 of them had the opportunity to wait some days until a bed at ICU was opening for them, and 25% of them died. Um, we have the opportunity to receive more Wairachis. Currently, I have um, almost 30. Uh, and we use in, in, in both ways with the, the CPAP de device and uh, to provide high flow for, for nasal, nasal device. No? Um, we had made another accountability in November uh, with another 50 patients. This time, after the learning of the since July, our success was 70%. 20% of, or 70% of patients went to the ICU and 10% of them died. So uh, the, 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 the opportunity to learn how to use the appropriate, appropriate indication, the time of indication, it was uh, things that we uh, have, to have to learn. But certainly we, now we, have, we are very expeditive in the use uh, as soon as the, 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 we assume that patient with um, a low flow device is not working, uh, if we have uh, the space or one of these uh, equipments, we introduce to the patient and the, the success for now, for now, for, for, for in this kind of situations, are around 70 percent. Uh, now we, we are over, overwhelmed with, because the, 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 pan, the second wave, uh, now we don't have enough de devices. Probably we need 15 more devices. Uh, the problem is that we don't have enough oxygen for those devices. So it's uh, real, really, uh, really complicated to see patients that could have the opportunity, but we don't have uh, more white latches, but we can offer any any additional for them because we don't have en enough oxygen. So we are working on implement more oxygen for my hospital at least, and then try to 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 recover more patients. So I I, I we are very thankful to, for the the opportunity to have these devices. They re they they, they really change the game for many patients and we have the opportunity to save many lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Malaga. That's been very helpful and very, very striking. Um, I think uh, we have some minutes uh, so that uh, some of the uh, people that are with us can ask questions. So if you, if you know how to, or if you want to lift your hand, or if you just want, Okay, so we have one question here from UCL SSSTH. Un unmute, please, please unmute. So my name is uh, Stephen Hart and just wanted to congratulate you, uh, Juan, Your Excellency Juan Carlos and also Minister uh, Ricardo Malca for the brilliant way in which you got all that information to Peru and made a real difference and also of course Congratulations to Rebecca and also to Herman, uh, to those who, and, and also Danielle, who were able to do that. It's actually really a wonderful story to hear in, in sort of terrible times that we're living in at the moment. It's wonderful to hear this and congratulations to everyone who did this. I suppose my question will be a nice quick one really to Rebecca, which is I've heard lots of different stories about how quickly you put together the CPAP. Um, and and it's, it sounds like it was it was very quick indeed, but I wondered if you could just give us a, a brief description of how how you did that um, and how quickly you put together that, because it seemed to be that it was almost uh, that you thought about it. And before you knew it, um, it was it was there. Um, I wonder, uh, Rebecca, if that's all right, if you could do that. Thank you. Absolutely. Um 
yes so so our team came together I think on the 17th of March looking back so that was myself and um, Tim Baker who's a professor of mechanical engineering design at UCL and Mervyn Singer who's our clinical lead he's a um, professor of critical care medicine and basically that's when we decided to do CPAPs to try and manufacture CPAPs the NHS and um we basically knew we had a few weeks because the peak of the first surge was due to hit the Easter weekend in, in London. Um, so what we did was that we, we started off by essentially reverse engineering and, or copying an existing device, which um, Danielle mentioned, the, um, the whisper flow, which is a purely mechanical device. And that meant that we had a hope of doing it quickly. So the first thing we did was to comp do an exact replica of that and then we did a lot of work on the design to try and minimize oxygen utilization and managed to bring that down by about 70%. Um, but from the first meeting in a hundred hours, we, back, we were back in the hospital um, with the Mercedes teams testing at UCLH. And then we received um, approvals from the regulator, the medical regulator in the UK, the MHRA, 10 days after our first meeting. Um, we released all of the designs open source on the 5th of April. And that's when the teams like in Peru started downloading them. So, so that was really fantastic to see. And then we delivered the 10,000 for the NHS on the 15th of April. Mercedes were making them at 1,200 a day. So it was a busy time. Um, um, but then there's been a huge amount of work since then. And a lot of that work has been with international partners, um, such as the Peru engineers and clinicians. And um, it's been really staggering and amazing to see how quickly other teams have been able to take up those designs. And it's been brilliant to be able to work so closely with them and see the impact that it's having in other countries, which you know, is incredibly um, heartwarming from our perspective. And obviously we're keen to do it as much as we can to, to help, um, help our, our new friends with continuing that trajectory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I, you I was wondering, I'll ask a short question. Um, I was wondering whether other countries that are producing CPAPs also have the trouble with uh, with getting circuits. Yes, they do. So, I mean, it's something that I hadn't realized before we embarked on this initiative, but there's real supply supply chain constraints for these, for any kind of breathing circuits in low and middle income countries in particular. So, you know, the, the issues that the teams in Peru were facing in terms of accessing these circuits aren't unique to Peru. We've had similar conversations with other teams across Latin America. Um, and then similarly, you know, Palestine, India, Pakistan, um, Africa, um, you know, we're working with teams in all of those countries. And, and this is, is a common problem across, across all of them. So we're able obviously to continue to work um, closely with the embassy and the Peru teams and we can supply the circuits and we're doing that at cost. So there's no, 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 um, we're not, we're not taking any profits. It's all done at, at cost. Um, but it, you know, it's certainly not a unique issue to Peru, but it's something that I think needs to be considered for the long term across, across the world, you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. A question from Lord Mark Evans, please. Your Lordship. Ambassador, thank you so much. Um, very quickly, first of all, it's a fantastic story, and I congratulate uh, Rebecca and uh, all the UCL team. And it's wonderful, it's also being rolled out around the world. Um, a question, um, yes, no, I just wanted from a Canning House perspective, and I see also our chairman is here today on this call. Um, are you at the embassy doing any fundraising to finance some more um, acquisitions of this very valuable equipment? Thank you. Thank you very much. We are indeed, and this is part of the fundraising. In, in, a, in a while, I'll be sharing the, the uh, details of the bank accounts uh, anybody can, can uh, donate to. Those uh, bank accounts have been done in conjunction with the International Medical Education Trust. Thank you for the question. Bravo. Uh, Ambassador, I'm so sorry, I have to go now, but I'll stand by to hear from the embassy what the arrangements are for payment, if, if Fanny could very kindly send that to me. Yes, of course. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for coming or for being here. Yeah, it's a, what I, a I wonderful there was story. Some other question somewhere. So I thought, I, yes, Blanquia Gallardo. Hello, uh, my name is Blanca, and I'm having an NGO actually to save rivers and lakes in the area of 
Amazonas in Peru, working especially in Huanuco, one of, one of the places more devastated by COVID, is dying uh, around one to two person per hour right now. Uh, uh, Dr. Herman Bauer is here with me. He is from uh, uh, Hospital Salud, and he can uh, he can uh, uh, also tell the, the, the same story as me. The situation, and I'm, I'm living in Denmark, the situation in Peru is completely disparate in Huanuco. So we, uh, as NGO, uh, uh, been uh, raising uh, a little uh, of money and then uh, borrowing some money in bank. We have both uh, two uh, plants, um, oxygen plants, to Huanuco just arrived uh, for a couple of days. It's working from today uh, with the hospital of Dr. Herman Bauer in Salud. Uh, but it's, it's very, very, very difficult to help because, for example, in the town I'm talking to, uh, it needs almost 680 uh, cylinders of oxygen. We are producing all the plants, including ours, uh, uh, around the 250. So it's extremely need for ox oxygen there. We also been donating wairachis uh, uh, to, to a salute, but they are not able to use it because they don't have the oxygen. So my, my question is, if there is another way to increase a other kind of feeding circuits that, that could help uh, uh, and not only the Wairachis because, because of, of, they cannot use it now. I think um, uh, Dr. Herman uh, Bauer will may, maybe uh, say, they have like 17 there. They cannot use it because they don't have oxygen. So, um, we are also trying to raise uh, help to get oxygen. But my question is, there is another kind of breathing circuits that could help uh, as well with, uh, with the not so much oxygen? Rebecca, Rebecca, I don't know whether you can answer that. Uh Hi, um, hello, Blanca. I've, I've heard your story as well, so it's a it's a pleasure to um, um, be connected with you. Um, so, so there are other types of breathing circuits um, and other kind of configurations of breathing circuits, but we we did a lot of work to design the configuration of this one and this specific design because it uses a lot less oxygen than others. So basically, if you change parts of this circuit, it increases the oxygen flows that are needed to get the same amount of oxygen to the patient, um, which obviously in situations like you're describing where the oxygen is really under a lot of pressure, you know, there's not enough oxygen, then obviously you want to use the most efficient system as possible. So, so I mean, I would personally <laughs> advocate quite strongly for, for these circuits, which, which enable that to be optimized. Thank you. Any more questions, please? Well, I did offer that this would be a 30 minute briefing. So um, I will now share with you the details of the account where um, you can, if possible, send your donations to. I'd like to give special thanks to today's speakers for having wrenched themselves from their very important work to join us in order to give us a state of the moment description on how these devices are being used and why more are urgently needed. I think this is one of the more British, one more British contribution to health safety in the world. And I urge you or your company not only to donate, but also to help us raise funds by spreading the word amongst friends and relatives that might be willing to support this effort. Special thanks from my part to the International Medical Education Trust that I already mentioned, who have very kindly joined us in this effort. And as I said, all monies will be uh, received by in their accounts and they will, I'm sorry, I've got the wrong, I've got the wrong, uh, wrong information on this is it um as i was saying thank very many thanks to international medical education trust and uh, last but not least of course many thanks to you 
to, to all of you the, for having shown us interest in this very uh, important subject. We, we are in dire need of help, as has been explained by Dr. Malaga and by Mr. Um, by, by the previous speakers. So um, I, I, unless there's something else, anybody's, I'm receiving some things here. Well, I, the, this presentation has been taped and so we will be sending it to other people and companies that unfortunately couldn't join us at this time. And so um, without having, uh, yeah, yes. No, no. Steve. I wonder, I wonder uh, Juan Carlos, uh, I wonder, could you put the information on the screen again? Yes, I don't I see. Can, of is that, is that, thank you very much. Yes. Amongst you, I've seen many people that are very linked to Peru. We have people listening in from Hayworth who are linked to Machu Picchu, especially to Machu Picchu. And of course, we have Camp Canning House with us and so many other friends of Peru. Uh, Ambassador, it's uh, Nick McCall speaking from Canning House, actually, that you just mentioned. Yes. Um, a quick question. How much are you looking to raise in the first instance? Well, w we are the, the, the amount of breathers, the, the, the amount of circuits we need in Peru is, has practically no limit because it is um, estimated and Rebecca will, will or, or one of the engineers might be able to confirm, but you need three or four circuits per device so that once the, one patient is finished using the device, another can use it immediately. That, that is the ideal. So, uh, perhaps, Rebecca, perhaps you, you could help me on, on, on that matter. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the cost per breathing circuit, I believe, is about, um, it's about 80 pounds, including shipping. And, you know, essentially you need one breathing circuit per patient that you treat. So, so I mean, I, I, I don't know exactly how many you're seeking to, to purchase in the first instance, but, you know, certainly of the order of thousands, I believe, would be would be something would be what we were aspiring to. Uh, and if I could just have a follow up question, and I know there are other people uh, who are trying to ask questions, so I'll be brief. Um, if at some point actually oxygen production becomes a limiting factor, is there anything the UK can do uh, to fund? I'm assuming I'm not a technical person, but there must be sort of portable oxygen um uh, machines that the uk could help with thank you this is a complicated matter uh, obviously the peruvian government has decided and is embarked on a campaign to improve oxygen levels in the country they are buying they, they have uh, uh, made uh, agreements with the engineering university in peru who will be uh, building around 30 30 odd plants and there will be importation of, of oxygen as well. So we hope to have the, the gap um, lessened very, very soon. I don't know whether Dr. Malaga has more information on that as he's on the ground. Excuse me, about the, the implementation of more oxygen devices, or more oxygen supplementation? Getting more oxygen to, to Peru. Yeah, and I think there is a, a great effort from the government to okay. effectively, uh, the private and private too, to, to donate and implement the oxygen plants and the hospitals. Um, so I will think that for the future, in a couple of months, we, have, we are going to have enough oxygen, but for now, we are really complicated. The, the problem is that the implement a plant of oxygen have, takes, uh, many of them have, many parts have to be uh, imported. Uh, the manufacturing plants here is complicated and takes several weeks. And, and, but until now, we don't have uh, options. Uh, try 
for example, for example in my hospital, uh, we get a plan to, to fill bo these bottles of oxygen in order to, so the, the, all the patients that uh, mild cases of people that uh, are in, in winning of, uh, uh, from Guairachis or winning from, uh, from ICU, uh, are receiving oxygen from the, these bottles in order to keep the, the central oxygen uh, uh, net uh, uh, with enough uh, pressure for, to, for the mechanical ventilators and for the high flows and wairaches too. So we, and so they are uh, uh, individual and local, uh, well, local uh, solutions until we wait, we are waiting for the uh, final solution that must be and in expand the oxygen of offered through new plants and to through build more capacity for the for the hospital. But like Wanuko, uh, there they are several problems. And the, the, I am talking about Lima, that is the capital, and the, we are working that. Uh, in a um, teaching hospital in the north of Lima, and uh, we have problems with oxygen. I can't imagine how who are working, for example, in Guanaco in another cities of from Peru. But uh, it's, it's hard to work here. Uh, but I think that we are receiving the support, but it's not enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I think we can wrap it up. Uh, once again, thanking everybody for their, their presence, uh, especially our speakers, Rebecca, Germán, um, and Mr. Daniel Acamine, who were very kind to join us today. As I say, once again, if you can possibly help us, the, the account numbers are on the screen. And uh, of course, if you want any more details about anything that has been talked about, please don't hesitate to write to the, the address postmaster at peruembassy-uk.com. Uh, um, thank you very much once again, and that'll be all. Until the next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for the work you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time, Paul.